This is Wellness by Designs and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Today we're chatting with Jesse Supaya, an integrative physiotherapist, and we're going to be discussing the place of nutraceuticals in physiotherapy practice. Welcome to Wellness by Designs, Jesse. How are you? Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm well. Great to chat again, mate. Now, take us through, I've got to say, you know, from this sort of orthodox perspective of physiotherapy, it's kind of like me with my nursing background when I just used to poo-poo nutraceuticals outright without any knowledge of them. What opened your mind to the merits of nutraceuticals in therapy? Yeah, it's a great question. It's something I pondered myself, actually. Um, And I think it really all started for me when I started my journey towards my own health. So I started working pretty closely with personal trainers um, at quite an elite level. So working often three, four sessions a week, um, and we sort of got quite deep into the whole diet, nutrition, and how it affects your mind, body. And that, that's when I started to use nutraceuticals myself and feel and really recognize the benefits. Um, and from there, I started to realize that there was a lot of merit to yeah, nutrition and minerals and vitamins. And I could feel and see the benefit that I would ha- was having in myself and how it was affecting my own training and physique. And yeah, from there, I started to work a bit closer with naturopaths and dietitians and took on board some of their advice and then it sort of prompted my own interest into studying and reading and I started to read different books about gene health and vitamins and in in addition to what I was already studying about anatomy and physiology, I started to just be curious about various, uh, I guess, yeah, supplements and how they worked and what the research was around it and what the benefits were and Try a bit of trial and error on my own front, you know, made the, the typical uh, mistakes of using certain things at the wrong times and not being able to sleep and things like that. And <laughs> but um, I've come a long way since then. And, yeah, I guess in terms of how it fell into my practice, I, when I graduated, I didn't initially start using them. It wasn't until I started to use them more myself with more of a targeted specific effect. And I realized it was really important for me to actually understand how I could. Um, And that's when I started to reach out to different brands, practitioner grade brands. And I found that was so much information and educational content out there um, by different brands to help practitioners help their clients. So I started to access that more. And then just by reading and, yeah, um, attending seminars and things like that, I, I could start to pretty feel quite confident with recommending and, you know, giving a little bit of guidance to people. And then I think from there it sort of started to become more and more prevalent, more and more part of my practice. Started off very slowly and I still still use things quite conservatively and slowly, but, yeah. Cool. Um, take us through your sports. What's the level? You yeah, said that you my were sports. at a, an elite level. Yeah, it was it well competitive. So I was doing a competitive um, physique competition. So fitness physique, mm. um, more of an aesthetic thing, and that was quite yeah. quite challenging. I played basketball um, quite quite intensely as well. Uh, representative level and yeah it was a grade and that that really took its toll on my body so being able to recover and yeah train as well at the same time was was really I really found that to be um, quite useful in terms of focusing on being able to use um, nutrition and vitamins and minerals to help aid that and yeah I, I rarely got injured the whole time I did my first fitness comp when I was 20, play second, I was pretty happy with that. And, yeah, that was, that was a real experience. And just, well done. Thank you, yeah. So it was – seems like a long time ago now, but um, <laughs> at, the time, at the time it was, it was a real, uh, 
rewarding experience despite me probably thinking now is a bit of a waste of time. But <laughs> well, it's never a waste of time because you've, I think you probably know exactly what athletes go through with regards to injuries or potential injuries and recovering from them. So, you know, not just the risks, but indeed how to correct them. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So take us through the contribution that nutrition and diet has in the musculoskeletal system, I guess, first. Let's do a sort of, you know, review of okay. what, what nutrients are important, what dietary um, components are important as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I think first and foremost for me, what I find is just being hydrated, water. You know, our body's really 70% water. And I think that's something that I, I see a lot is especially with my manual therapy side of what I do, um, feeling people's tissues, you can really tell when someone's dehydrated and you get that, that sort of grittiness, those adhesions, um, the lack of flexibility and extensibility in the tissues uh, when you're working on thousands of bodies over the, the course of my career, you know when someone's not, not drinking enough water. And that, that in itself I think is you know, our body's 70% water on average and even something like the intervertebral discs, our tendons, ligaments, a lot of it is water and oh, comes down to really that. So, yeah. So I think people kind of forget how important it is, you know, sky water, I like to call it. Um, mm. It's it's really important because without that, we just don't have that flow of circulation. There's no blood. The lymphatic system can't do its job. And yeah, the, all the fibers and the myofascial system, it, they become tight and brittle and they just won't stretch and lengthen like they should. So one of the biggest things I tell people is, are you drinking enough water? And there's a simple calculation for that, that I use. Um, and that was taught to me by a nutritionist. It's um, your body weight multiplied by 0 0.03. So body weight in kilos times 0 0.03 and that gives you the amount of water in liters that you need for optimal hydration based off your body weight so that's that's something i often just a number i just pull up for people um, and you can do it in five seconds and a lot of people don't realize they're not actually getting enough water and they ask me you know oh is is tea or coffee does that count or juices or smoothies and to, to me, the answer is no, because, you know, tea and coffee, it's not going to hydrate you in your cells like water is because that's the whole, the property of water is it's so <clears throat> clear. It, it's, it's an, it, our cells absorb it up because it's emptiness, you know, and it, it also helps to clear out impurities and flush out toxins and acid and things from our tissues, our musculoskeletal system. So if we're, it's just like if you have clear water and you put a tea bag in it, the water pulls out the tea in the same way it pulls out a lot of the toxins in the buildup. So particularly for someone who's exercising or training athletes or just people doing a lot of work, manual labor, you need water. Otherwise you're not going to feel you're going to be tight and you're going to yeah cause some kind of strain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really interesting that even orthodox practitioners are well versed and well accepting of uh, um, partial pressure of oxygen versus carbon dioxide <clears throat> excuse me um, but when you talk about water there seems to be this resistance to embrace a higher amount by orthodox practitioners even though given the function of the kidneys the kidneys aren't a filter they're a siphon and so mm. more water will actually get rid of more solutes. Um, it's just the way that they work. There's a Guyton's thing, sorry, <laughs> Guyton's <laughs> physiology. Um, but it's really interesting when you speak about joints and, you know, we, we think about the circulatory system or we might even think about complexion, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of mm, outward expression, if, if you like, of of um, the importance of water to the tissue fluids, but we don't think about 
not just interstitial fluid, but organs, um, tissues, like, for instance, you were mentioning vertebral, intervertebral discs, collagen, um, you know, glucosamine chondroitin, hold on to water. That's how they work. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. Interesting yeah. mind flip. Thank you for that. And I'm learning. It, yeah. This is good. Me too, yeah. Well, it's something so simple, I think, and, and it's just one of those low-hanging fruits. A lot of I find a lot of patients get a lot of value out of it if they actually stick and abide by the recommendations. Um, yeah, but you mentioned something as well that I, I definitely have found to be helpful, especially in the clientele that I see. It's collagen and, and its role in the musculoskeletal system. Um, yeah, I think my... My understanding of collagen is that it is really, it's, it's the word itself means gel. It's a Greek word, collagen. And I think a lot of people don't understand what it is or where it comes from or why it's important to take. But when you look at our current diet and what's available to us, even in a supermarket or if you go to a restaurant, there's not a lot of collagen around for us to consume. Mm. And our ancestors and as humans, we've evolved consuming collagen probably up until the last maybe 60, 50 years, we kind of stopped. I know my grandmother's recipe book has bone soup in it, you know, and recipes of all that kind of stuff and the bone marrow and the fat of that. So I think, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, our current understanding around it is based off research when really it was like just part of our everyday life was consuming collagen. Yeah. I think, I think we got sources. caught up in these three sort of macronutrient sort of things about, you know, protein, carbs, and fat, you know, and, and we <laughs> forgot what we ate with those. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I find that, um, Collagen is really, really important from, from my own personal experience with using it and consuming it for my own recovery and well-being and just skin, hair, nails. And in a lot of clients as well, I find that their symptoms and just general sort of the feedback that they give once they start increasing the amount of collagen that they're taking is, is huge, you know, and, and again, we talk about those structures like the intervertebral discs or <clears throat> the tendons, you know, anywhere sort of from 7% up to 30% collagen. It's in that matrix, like a spider web. So if we're not consuming it from our dietary sources and our body is not able to produce it, then it's, it's really hard for people to, yeah, to have that same strength in those connective tissues. Cool. Um, I want to just sort of circle back for a tick with regards to um, your athletic prowess. And, and like you mentioned two things that were that normally one would think about them being quite juxtaposed, physique training and basketball. So you've got, you know, basketball with the explosive energy, the compression issues with regards to tissues when you're jumping, when you're landing, twisting, things like that. And then you're getting, uh, you know, body sculpting. Do I say that? Body sculpting, body yeah. Yeah, physique yeah, training? Yeah. Body sculpting, um, yeah. <clears throat> so with that sort of thing, would you treat it as an explosive type force when you, you know, have to strike a pose and, and, and flex the muscles in a way that presents aesthetically to the judges? Is that like a... Explosive. Um, yeah, it's... It, is it a similar contraction? No, I, it, they're, they're two different things. It's not, yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they're two very different functions. So what I found was getting... the, the physique training was slowing me down, but in some ways it was speeding me up because it depends on your coach. And I was fortunate to have some very good coaches and they were aware of, you know, my, my dual interest. So it wasn't, and I wasn't at that level that I was so big that I could actually, I was still look fairly healthy <clears throat> body weight naturally as well. And I think it's just having strength is super important, but when you're posing and flexing, 
you are, it's really just that isometric contraction. Yeah. It's that, yeah. And with, that, that's, with, it's with, almost. With, with all tension, like for instance, on your biceps and triceps at one time, correct. does that correct. create that juxtaposed, um, because you're, you're creating tension on both muscles, an extensor and a flexor, um, does it create a risk of injury at the insertion of that ju- of that muscle, those muscles? I, I wouldn't say that it creates a risk of injury. I would say that it helps to stabilise the joint in a, in, a, in a way. What it probably does over time by doing those kind of sustained isometric poses would be you become quite inflexible and immobile. Ah, right. Yeah, which, which in <clears throat> itself is, well, I'm sure we'll touch on that later, but immobility in a joint is, is one of the biggest risk factors for injury. So in hindsight, it was just me pursuing my interests. There wasn't any sort of um, rhyme or reason to what I was, what sports or you know, activities I was doing. I definitely wouldn't recommend people pursue both. So, yeah, you want that elasticity, yeah. that power versus, yeah. Yeah. So let's go into injuries. And if you're talking, you know, about jumping and landing and things like that, lower back pain. Because what, what is it, 50% yes. of the population? Is that right? <clears throat> yeah. Well, it, I think as some people say in Australia, it can be up to 70% of people have suffered from Whoa. lower back pain. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. At, some, okay. at some point in their lives. So, yeah. Yeah. So what works and where is the place? I, I like that you mentioned judicial supplementation. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, what do you use? We're talking about collagen. You know, previously mm-hmm. we used to use glucosamine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I've never, ever found the hydrochloride form works with anything other than fingers and toes. And indeed, there's the negative trial, the GATE trial on that. Interestingly, medicos who don't know about different types of nutrients will poo-poo all of the glucosamine based on the GATE trial without looking at that issue that of that journal. I think it was JAMA. And um, even in that issue, that same issue, there was an editorial piece saying, dudes, you've used the wrong form in the GATE trial. You should have been using glucosamine sulfate. And then, of course, we have to include chondroitin sulfate and the cofactors that we use for collagen. But now we've got collagen. In the past, we didn't use collagen because we couldn't. We weren't allowed by the TGA. Now we're allowed to use collagen. So, of course, there's this flip to using collagen. Um, yeah, have you ever superior. used glucosamine in your history or? I haven't. I haven't. And I think it's more because of the fact that we have collagen so readily available and I just got onto collagen so early. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, so what's its place? Where can it work in lower back pain? And you mentioned inflexibility. You know, mm. what's its place? How do you actually um, assess a patient for suitability of collagen or perhaps even, no, listen, you need to work on your core strength and some flexibility and that'll take away your lower back pain. Yeah. Look, it's, it's, I wouldn't, I don't ever start there. I, it's, it's definitely a, it's a supplement to the primary things that I offer. Um, it, it's all with low back pain. It is, I guess it's just like anything. It's such a big, broad term and the, for me, it's I really need to understand what is causing this or what things are causing it, the biggest contributing factors. Like I guess the way I or what I like to do in my sessions is kind of map out all the causes of pain. So I guess you have the pain is the problem and where are the roots of this problem and which roots are the biggest, which things out of all the thing, the web of determinants that could be contributing to this person's complaint, what things are weighing the heaviest on them? Physically, mentally, emotionally, environmentally, socially, what is causing that person's back, tissues, discs, spine, nerves, fascia, muscles to send those signals to the brain? And why is the brain then saying, hey, there's something wrong. You need to feel pain. 
So that, that for me, it all starts with just a real thorough health history, um, understanding all of their health issues, making sure you get a clear, because the lower back is so closely connected to the abdomen and the core. I don't like to use the word core, but trunk rather. This previous surgeries, there's, there's a range of things that can be causing it. I mean, the, one of the things that I find the most is really just inactivity, sitting, um, inability to stabilize in the trunk. So just having very poor lumbar pelvic stability, um, which is something that I think a lot of people suffer from. And the other things as well that I often find is referred pain. So pain, as we know, can be referred from visceral structures to somatic structures that are innervated by the same spinal nerve. So for example, you might get um, uh, a young person, early 20s, female, and they have sort of intermittent low back pain that gets worse but they don't know quite know why. And then if you map out their symptoms and you understand their health, their health history, it actually shows that, oh, when they're menstruating, it gets worse. So then you know that there's a direct correlation between what's going on and it may not necessarily all be coming from their back. It could be something that is being contributed to by an issue with their ovaries, which they need to go see someone for. So it's really important to not overlook that and, you know, I had, I had a really um, um, heartbreaking experience with my own mother who was suffering from low back pain. And it was, she came to her doctor and then after she came to me and we all thought it was sciatica, you know, and I, and I was assessing her and sort of treating her for a couple of weeks. It was about two or three weeks. And I said to her mum, you know, I don't, I don't think this is, this isn't your typical discogenic, um, pain, this is something else, you know, it's, it's in the area, the lower back, lumbar sacral junction, but it's not, I'm not feeling it. It's not, I'm not, it's not presenting in the, the typical way. I think you should get an MRI. So she did, she got the MRI and they found there was a huge mass, a tumor that was actually pressing on the spinal nerve in her, in her sacrum, which was causing referred pain down the leg. So you know, it's the things that we, we all learn about at university, these red flags and things. But I think once you get out into clinic and you start actually seeing clients, you kind of forget about it because we're in our clinic, in our room with the person. There's only just so much you can think about at the one time. So, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things where when someone says to me low back pain, it's like, well, yeah, it could be anything. Can, can I ask, you, you said something very very important it's critical to learn and that is how do you tell the difference between discogenic and viscerogenic type pain what are the what are the differentiating factors in the pain presentation yeah it's it's something that i think i'm still getting my head around because there's so many sites and sources of of referrals but palpation is a really big tool that I use to just my own sensory acuity in my fingers being able to sort of reproduce their pain with palpation and pressure of the spine, but also pressure on the organs as well. Yeah. So being able to, because often if, if it is coming from the viscera and you are able to get in and you know where to go and you know your anatomy well enough, you can actually find that, oh, it could be that, you know, it's your your stomach or your intestine or your colon. If I press on that, and does that refer to the back? And there has been some cases where I found that it is the abdomen that that's the problem, and you, you're gotcha. pressing it, and it's rep symptom reproduction through palpation <clears throat> is a is a big one. Um, another one is also just mechanical assessment. So obviously, we know with flexion the discs. Are more if they're already protruding, extruded, then there's certain tests that we know have very good sensitivity and specificity when it comes to being able to deduce whether it is 
disc involvement. So that's definitely something that I utilize, like the slump, active straight leg raise, increasing intra-abdominal pressure, those sorts of things. Um, And even just the mechanism as well. So the mechanism of action around their, their pain presentation so that, you know, when I'm prolonged sitting or prolonged static standing, I feel it versus a viscerosomatic referral might be more along the lines of after I eat certain foods or after I go to the toilet or, yeah, at this certain time of the month. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Got it. So, so it's more of- detective work rather than the characteristics of the pain itself, sharp, stabbing, burning, dull, throbbing, that sort of pain sensation description. What you're looking at is further than that. You're looking at other things that might affect when, where, how that pain is presented. Yeah, exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong, I still do take those um, pain characteristics into account, but the brain doesn't differentiate between those things because it, uh, we're talking about it's at the dorsal horn like in the if you go back into i guess year one anatomy you know that the, the merging of the spinal nerve it gets it gets information from all those the skin the the skeletal tissues the organs and it all converges into that one spinal nerve which goes in and if someone's saying hey i've got this pain there well yeah okay it, it could be that you're getting that sharp pain from you know, the, the body's pain is such a, it's such mm. a subjective experience, such a Personalized, individual yeah. experience. Yeah. It's very hard for me to, to use the characteristics of the pain. Yeah. To determine where it's coming from. So I, no, I don't no, rely heavily on that. Yeah. No, no, that's cool. Because I, like I was wondering about, you know, we've evolved from the pain gate theory, which was current when I went through nursing and we've evolved mm-hmm. from that to this sort of, psychosocial physio aspect of pain we know more about you know complex regional pain syndrome chronic neurogenic neuropathic pain blah 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 Mm -hmm. pain can be influenced by stress even how you're being spoken to by a health practitioner indeed it's in the guidelines of pain Mm -hmm. management about how you your words to a patient can affect their management of pain and this is something that health practitioners don't give enough credence to how you treat somebody is going to affect how well their pain is going to be managed it's huge it's huge Uh, such a huge issue yeah um yeah jesse because we're talking a little bit about sport before there's so much that i want to cover and we've only got a certain amount of time so can we talk about sports related injuries as well you know like you've got yeah. simple things like you know you're rolling an ankle and and quote unquote pulling a muscle um tight backs sore necks things like that hips that might be sore but then you've got real structural possibly surgical things like slap tears and you know bulging discs and all of that sort mm-hmm. of thing can you take us through that spectrum in 20 words or less um, <laughs> um, <laughs> with how you manage reme- let's say the words remedial and that seems rather remedial. Good, but let's say more remedial to more chronic um, fulminant type of issues sure yeah so the, 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 I think the biggest misconception that I have to battle with, with, with anything along the sports injury uh, spectrum, whether it be uh, acute or chronic, it's, it's the use of ice and anti-inflammatories. I think it's, and, 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 and the yep. perceived benefit in musculoskeletal strains and sprains, tears and things like that. Um, Cause that often people would, will come to me saying, uh, you know, I've put ice on it. I've, I've taken anti-inflammatories. It's not getting better. I've rested it following that, that typical uh, rice principle. So this, this is something that I'm really, I've been really blessed to understand 
the inflammatory cycle, the tissue healing process in quite good detail, just from paying attention in my anatomy and physiology classes. So the first thing is ice. I think, you know, people use ice a lot, sprain an ankle, slap some ice on it. <laughs> is that going to actually do anything to change the temperature of the internal tissue that's damaged? When you think about it, it's going to cause frostbite if you do that for long enough, okay? So, so what is it actually doing? It's All it's doing is providing a bit of proprioceptive, I guess, distraction from the pain. It's not helping with the healing at all. So there is actually some, quite a lot of information in sports medicine journals and textbooks that show that ice inhibits lymphatic drainage because oh. you're you're stopping the lymph vessels from doing their work and carrying that excessive fluid through the tissues by putting ice on it for prolonged periods so um it's especially around an injured area so i think to try and control swelling um so that's something that i think is for me i don't recommend ice unless people want to use it or they feel like it helps their pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The set, yeah. I, I mean, this is this is now the groundswell is starting to take shape, isn't it, <laughs> with regard to the controversy of, of ice in rice. Um, <laughs> and I totally get your point about it inhibits a natural process of inflammation because of our Absolutely. fear of inflammation and and our wanting to switch off inflammation rather than control inflammation. Absolutely. It's this well, switch swelling, mentality swelling is a good to. thing. Yeah, swelling yeah. swelling is necessary. It's a fundamental component of phase one of the healing process. You know, the amount of fluid that's sent to a damaged area, whether it be your intervertebral discs or your labrum in your shoulder or, you know, your anterior cruciate ligament, it's it's not a chaotic arbitrary process it's a vigilantly regulated process designed to help the body regain homeostasis and it, yeah. it depends on the lymphatic system to move that fluid around and to help to regulate it i mean when you think about it the lymphatic system it's really just a scavenger it's just cleaning up that excess fluid you know it's it's a, taking all those proteins those molecules that debris from the damage and it's like a flooded house or a flooded yard you know it's it's needing to move that out through the capillaries eventually back into the circulatory system so if we interfere with that in a healthy person we're we're disrupting the healing process yeah you know and, and yeah. I, I really like what you said about our fear of inflammation where yeah. are we at with the research about this with regards to drainage um, you know, you mentioned lymphatics, getting rid of damaged tissue particles, and indeed, in the end, the be all and end all is healing. Do, do mm. we have any information yet that says that says that not doing ricer is better at healing people's inflamed joints? Do we do we have that bridge yet? Yeah, it's it's been it's been. It's been known for a long time. It, there is sports medicine, the use of cryotherapy in, in sports injuries, volume three, sports medicine, the textbook of medical physiology, 10th edition. There's, it's in the textbooks on how the lymphatic system works. And there's even research out there about that's talking about anti-inflammatories and how the effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory effects on bone healing. So there's, there's research that's been done on the use of anti-inflammatories in fracture healing. So I think we know that inflammation can occur without healing. We know that, but healing cannot occur without inflammation happening first. You know, the inflammatory phase, it's mediated by the same prostaglandins that are blocked by non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Mm. So... Mm. In a, in a healthy healing process, we all learn that it's that proliferative phase that comes following the, the inflammatory phase, 
you know, and then those fibroblasts come in and they build that extracellular matrix. And then we have that maturation phase. And if all goes well, the functional tissue is laid down. That's, that's just standard textbook, you know, physiology and anatomy. But mm. the key point is that each phase of the healing cycle is necessary for the subsequent phase. So if we interfere with that, yeah. So I think that it's, it's yeah. definitely out there. Um, the research is out there. It's if, just... you, if you think about um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they're the perfect drug because what they do is they take away the horrible symptom that you don't like while inhibiting the healing, the chondroprotective, or forgive me, the chondro-rejuvenative processes of the body. They inhibit that. So what does that mean? That means you need more drug. So it's the, it's the perfect <laughs> drug that manages the, yeah. the horrible symptom while prolonging its need. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a great... Um... It's a great analogy. I like to use the one. It's like having the check engine Don't light come on in your car. <laughs> it's no. It's like having the check engine light come on in your car, and then just pulling out the the cable of the light, and just nothing's yeah. wrong. Just nothing's yeah. Wrong. So don't get don't get me wrong. They have their place, um, ice and anti-inflammatories, but I think people relying on them and using them as the go-to um, for me, it's yeah, it's one of the it's one of the things I spend the most time educating and sort of yeah re-educating yeah. people on jesse jesse we have a lot to cover and mm -hmm. i i can already sense we're not even scratching the surface yet so i'm going <laughs> to say right now would you would you join us back for a part two because sure. <laughs> we're going to go i'm going to ask you a couple of questions we haven't got a lot of time <laughs> left but i, I want to ask a couple of questions but there's so much more that we need to get into would you sure. would you mind joining us back for a part two in in the new year? Is that cool? If it's if it's this much fun, you might yeah you can have, <laughs> we can do it <laughs> done done. All right. So so what about more muscle related pain? Um, hmm. You know, do you favour the use of things like branch chains in um, the use with, let's say, DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, or do you stick to things like magnesium, which is just hopefully going to relax a myofibril? How do mm. you balance therapy? What do you choose? And please put I that choose? in the context yeah. of physical therapies. Yeah, so, well, let, I, I put a lot of merit to magnesium and its role in musculoskeletal function. I, as we know, magnesium is critical for the electrical potentials to take place that cause and affect muscle activity. So if we don't have an, enough magnesium circulating and in our tissues, we're not actually going to get nice quality muscle contractions. Um, and there's, there's, as you know, there's a lot of research around the benefits of magnesium in bone health and it makes up about 1% of the mineral content of bone and things like that. But particularly for those, I guess, overuse, repetitive strain related um, complaints, one of the biggest things that I find in terms of being able to help people is not enough mobility and stretching and, and not enough stability and strength first and foremost. Um, because there's one thing to be able to get more magnesium into their circulation and then it, in the hope that it will get absorbed into their tissues and, yeah, relax the, the nervous system a little bit more. But the biggest thing I find is just not enough stretching of the fascia, the ligaments, the muscles, because as we know, fascia, it's always moving and responding to the tensile load that gets placed on it. So it adapts and thickens and tightens in response to what we're doing. So like right now, for example, we're both sitting and when we sit, our hip flexors are shortening and they stay shortened and our abdominals are slightly shortened. So when we stand back up, all that's been shortened, pulling us down into flexion. So the extensors have such a hard time to overpower and overwork that. So hence why our back and our glutes and middle back 
erector spinae muscles and multifidus rotatories <clears throat> can just become hyperactive because they're having to overcome the shortening that takes place in the front side of the body. And if you think about how many people are sitting for hours and hours, you know, at work, eating, going to the movies, driving a car, even sleeping in the fetal position, you're in that sort of flexed posture. I think it's, you know, it's inevitable that we all become tight and have some kind of repetitive overuse. Yeah, but but is the treatment of that though, <clears throat> you would think therefore that it would be stretching the abdominals and the hip muscles or the extensor muscles, but exactly you need to stretch the back because that almost snaps, sort of almost. Yeah, well, it's, it's is that the right word? Counter strains. Yeah, look, it it yeah, really depends on. It, it it depends on on the person, so it depends on what's causing their their particular um, complaint, so their particular injury. So, if it's if it's if I examine someone and and they, because obviously I assess range in the hips and I the, I can feel the hip flexors in the back, and you can always sort of once you work on someone, you can feel what it is that's blocked with simple, you know, full multi-segmental standing extension, flexion, isolated hip extension, isolated trunk extension, you, you can see quite quickly what's not moving where. And like a handbrake on a car, it's obvious when the handbrake's on. When you take the handbrake off, you release the hip flexors, you release your abdominals, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, my back feels so much better. Then you know clinical reasoning, okay. It was actually the tightness in the front that was pulling you down, causing the back muscles to be hyperactive, hypertonic, to try and overcome, to extend you up because they're anti-gravity muscles to maintain upright, right. erect posture. Yeah. So I guess gotcha. just, yeah, it's the, the body, the musculoskeletal system, it's working, it's very, it's, it's very intelligent. The receptors all over our body, in the muscles, spindles, the Golgi tendon organs, in the, the ligaments. There's even receptors in your bones, osteoreceptors, that are detecting strain and tightness and, you know, mechanoreceptors and things like that. Mm -hmm. All that information is getting sent up into the central nervous system, which is computing, deducing whether or not how much pain you want to feel or you need to feel based off the perceived threat in your life. So you can imagine that, yeah, you can that's right big topic <laughs> so big topic big topic so you kind of have to look at things zoom out and then zoom in when it comes to these sort of repetitive overuse injuries tight back necks hips yep yeah um we have to go through and we won't have time today so jesse i'm going to thank you for today but next time we meet I really want to go through more of the sports injuries and if we can sort of do a, let's say, a condition-based sort of symptom treatment um, type podcast, that would be wonderful because I'm learning so much from you right now. It's fantastic. It's awesome stuff you're doing. You're so welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Look forward to next time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Of course, you'll be able to catch up on the show notes for today's podcast. Remember, there's going to be a part two, so some of the references will be shared between the podcasts. And, of course, there's going to be all of the other podcasts on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is Wellness by Designs. Music.